Aloha and welcome to our Word of Life radio program here in wonderful Okinawa, Japan. え、ハワイ Check this out.
Yes. Dr. Jerry Savelle. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Well, I have a word for all of you this morning. Don't give up. Amen. Don't give up. Look at your neighbor and say, quit is not an option. Amen. Shake hands with somebody, smile real big, tell them you're in the right place today, and you can be seated. Praise God. Before I get started, uh, let me introduce to you uh, my international director, uh, Joe McCroskey, travels all over the world overseeing all of our offices. Joe, stand up. Amen. Joe has been traveling from one end of the planet to the other through our ministry, uh, overseeing our international offices, our Bible schools, our churches, our, our uh, programs uh, that we are involved in uh, from just all over the world, praise God. In fact, 
we get back home uh, Wednesday morning. He'll be taking off for Australia just a few days after that. And, and uh, you know, we never know where Joe is going to be next, but we know he's doing the work of the Lord, and he's been serving our ministry for over 35 years. Isn't that awesome? Give him another good hand. <laughs> Praise God. Thank God for faithful people. Amen. You got your Bibles with you. I'd like for you to open them to the 15th chapter of John. John chapter 15. And I want to read, begin reading in verse 11. These things, Jesus is speaking here, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Look at your neighbor and say, you should be full of joy. You know, I wish you to put a little more enthusiasm in that. At least smile when you say it. You should be full of joy. Now look at your neighbor and say, and don't be moved by what you see. I am full of joy. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> this is Jesus speaking. And did you notice he said, I want my joy, the joy of Jesus. A lot of people don't think in terms of Jesus being a joyful person. We know that he wept. We know that, you know, uh, he possibly grieved over certain situations. But here he's talking about his joy. He said, I want my joy to remain in you. That's a key word, remain. In other words, it's quite possible that you can have the joy of the Lord and it's quite possible that you can also lose it. But he said, I want it to remain in you. Everybody say remain. Yeah. That means to stay. That means to never depart, praise God. Now, we know that circumstances arise from time to time in our lives that cause us to lose our joy. But you don't have to lose your joy, no matter what the circumstances are. If you make it an act of your own will, in fact, begin decreeing, as I learned to do many, many years ago. When something happens that attempts to get my joy, I say out loud, this will not steal my joy. This will not steal my joy. Why? Because Jesus said, I want it to remain in you. And not only that, he said, and I want it to be full. The Amplified says, to reach full measure, complete overflowing, praise God, overflowing joy. Do you ever notice how some Christians have a hard time being around other Christians who overflow with joy? They mistake that for weird. That guy's weird. Why? Well, he just laughs all the time. I don't care what happens to him. He's got a smile on his face. That's not weird. <laughs> That should be the most natural thing for a believer. Weird for a believer is sad. Thank you for your enthusiasm. You're really hanging in here with me this morning, aren't you? No, that's strange for a believer. Uh, hopeless is strange for a believer. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, the only person or the only people in the world who have a right to be hopeless are those that don't know God and don't have a covenant with Him. That's found in Ephesians chapter 2. People that don't know God and do not have a covenant with Him have a right to feel sad, have a right to be depressed, and have a right to be hopeless. But believers do not have that right. Amen. Now, you might be sad sometime, and you might feel hopeless sometime. We all have been there, but get over it. You have a covenant with God. Give the Lord a shout for your covenant. Amen. You have a covenant with God. You know, when I first came to the Lord in 1969, I didn't know these things. Obviously, I didn't know anything about the Word of God. And... Um, I just live in my life like everybody else did. Actually, I was not living, I was just existing. I, I, I owned an automotive business. I was a paint and body man. Uh, my dad was a paint and body man. I grew up with that. My dad uh, repaired wrecked cars, 
My dad raced automobiles. I grew up on racetracks all over the southern part of the United States. We hauled race cars nearly every weekend. And my dad restored classic automobiles. And he represented everything I wanted to be. So he started teaching me the trade when I was just a little boy. And that's all I wanted to do. That's all I ever wanted to be, just like my daddy, you know. And so uh, my dad's dream was to own his own business someday, but he never got there. He always worked for somebody else. His expertise made other people rich. I wanted my daddy to teach me everything he knew, and I'd take his expertise and make me rich. You know? And I wanted my own business. In fact, how many of you remember when families used to have breakfast together? Anybody remember that? You have to be as old as I am. I don't think that exists anymore. But anyway, when I was growing up, families had breakfast together. Mom had the breakfast ready. You know, my sister and I got up to go to school. Dad would get up to go to work. And we all had breakfast together. And, you know, there might be some, 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 uh, some, some law that needed to be laid down. That's when it was done, you know. Uh, I always knew I was in trouble when they mentioned my middle name. You know, if it, it was Jerry, everything was cool. But if middle name was at it, uh, we in trouble, you know. And uh, thank God that didn't happen too often. But dad laid out some rules for the day, you know, or whatever. And, and mom discussed certain things. And, and before my dad went to work, every morning he would hear me say this. And he would wait for it. He wouldn't even get up from the table until he heard me say this. I started saying it when I was a little boy. And I said it all the way through high school. And I said, Dad, one of these days when I grow up, we're going to have our own business with a big sign out front, Savell and Dad. You know, <laughs> it's usually the father and son, but I'd always say Savell and Dad, and he'd get a kick out of that. You know, well, by the time I was 22 years old, I owned that business and uh, was doing exactly what I dreamed of all of my young life. However, I was not doing what God's dream was. God had called me into the ministry. I heard that call at the age of 11 in 1957 while I was watching Oral Roberts on television. But he was fouling up my plans, so I didn't tell anybody about it. <laughs> I never told a soul that I heard the call to preach. Never told anybody, because I knew if I ever told somebody, I'd have to do it, and I didn't want to do it. And I tried to stay out of settings where I got under conviction. You know, if I went to church and got out of conviction, I walked out because I knew if I ever yielded to that, I'd have to preach. And I did not want to preach. My wife, you know, she, she believed that I was going to get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and preach. And, and I was trying to prove to her that is never going to happen. Never going to happen. She's praying for me to surrender my life to God all the time. In fact, her prayer every night was, Lord, don't let him have any more fun until he surrenders his life to you. I say, Carolyn, I don't care if you serve God. In fact, you can move into the church if you want to. You go there every day. I think you got your own key to the place now. But leave me alone. I don't want to do that. I told her the night before we married, if you marry me, you're going to spend the rest of your life on a racetrack. She said, you don't know the power of intercessory prayer. I'm going to pray all that out of you. And if you notice, you never see my name mentioned at the, you know, at the NASCAR or the Indy 500. They never mention me. Why? Carolyn prayed all that out of me. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't know anything about the Bible. And so eventually, even though I own my own business, I'm living my dream. I mean, I'm 22 years old. I own my own business. I've got a beautiful wife. I've got two precious daughters. I have a brand new home. I have, you know, my wife's driving a de decent car. I've got a pickup truck. My dog loves me. I'm living the American dream. But deep down on the inside, I'm a miserable human being because I know I'm running from God, you know, and I, and I, I don't want to do what he's wanting me to do but I'm miserable because I'm not doing it. And finally, in 1969, I couldn't run anymore. I surrendered my life to the Lord. Now, by this time, you know, all is not so well in my life. My business is not doing well. My marriage is hanging on by a thread, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm deep in debt. 
I mean, it looks like the bottom has fallen out. I, I don't even know how I'm going to pay all my business debts, much less my personal debts. And, uh, you know, here I am, just a young man. I feel like I got the responsibility of a 45-year-old. And, and finally, I decided, you know, if I'm ever going to be happy, I better surrender my life to God. And I did, 1969, February the 11th, 3 o'clock in the morning. Somebody said, why at 3 in the morning? Because I fought it all night. You know? <laughs> and finally, I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and walked in the living room, lifted my hands. I said, God, I don't know why you still want me. You've been after me since I was 11 years old. I don't know why you still want me. I've been running from you. I've been rebellious. I'm a failure. What could you possibly do with me? He said, don't worry about it, son. I'm a master at making champions out of failures. You just turn your life to me, and I'll make a champion out of you, praise God. And he did, hallelujah, and I give him all the glory for it. But I discovered way back then, you know, I'd heard people talk about faith. You got to have faith. You need faith. If you had faith, you could move mountains. If you had faith. Well, I believe that because I could see it in the Bible. So I began to study about faith how to get faith, and how to apply for your faith. Boy, God sent me the best. Oral Roberts, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan, T.L. Osborne, they were my mentors. I didn't know any of them personally at that time, but through their resources, their books, their tapes, I was learning about faith. But then one day, the Lord said, now, develop joy in your life. I said, why do I need joy? He said, because faith and joy make an unbeatable team. Faith and joy make an unbeatable team. You see, joy keeps you from caving in. Joy enables you to keep a smile on your face even though everything around you seems to be falling apart. Now, Jesus is the one who said, I want my joy to remain in you, and I want your joy to be full, or as the Amplified said, overflowing. So that means that we are to be strong in our faith and at the same time be strong in joy. I find that joy is missing in the lives of most Christians because they are misinformed. And that I'm talking about is most Christians base their joy, or whether they have any or not, on circumstances, and that's wrong. Your joy should be based on your relationship with Christ, not on circumstances. Why? Because circumstances change, but Jesus never does. Amen. Amen. He's the same yesterday and forever. You can get up one morning and everything's going well, and the next morning it seems like all hell has broken loose in your life. And if you base your joy on circumstances, then that means one day you've got it and the next, next day you don't. And Jesus said, I want it to remain in you. I want you to be full of joy. Why is it so important? Look at chapter 16 and verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. Now tribulation is defined as uh, test and trials, adversity, challenges. In the world, you will have test and trials, challenges, and adversity. The only, the only way you will ever get to the place in your life where you won't have challenges, you won't have adversity, is you have to die and leave this planet. There was a guy, I was preaching at ORU one year uh, to a group of ministers, Brother Roberts had formed a ministerial association, asked me to be on the board, and then he had his first meeting there, and he invited me to be one of the speakers. And I'm preaching to probably 2,000 preachers. And one of them came up to me afterwards and said, Brother Jerry, would you please pray that I'll never have another test. I'll never have another trial. I'll never have any more adversity in my life. Never go through any more tribulation. So I laid my hands on him. I said, Lord, let this man die. He said, what? I don't want to die. I said, well, sir, that's the only way I know where you will never have another challenge. You have to die and leave the planet. He said, I don't want to die. I said, Lord, let him live. 
<laughs> I said, but you better learn how to walk in the blessing. You better learn how to walk in faith. And you better learn how to get some joy in your life. Because if you don't, your tests and your trials are going to defeat you, but they don't have to. You can overcome them all and be the winner that God's called you to be. Amen? You don't, you don't have to cave in to tests and trials. That's why Jesus said, I want you to be full of joy. Why? Because in the world, you will have tests and trials. You will have challenges. You will have adversity. But be of good cheer. That's the same thing as be full of joy. Why? Because I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Amen? Now, I like to say it this way. The key to being full of joy is you got to know what he said in his word and you have to continually remind yourself of it. you got to know what he said in his word and continually remind yourself of it. You know, the Apostle Paul, probably the greatest man of faith outside of Jesus himself that ever walked this planet. And the man faced adversity all the time. In fact, he, he said in uh, the book of Acts to a group of people one time, he said, the Holy Ghost has already revealed to me that in every city I go to, there is adversity waiting there for me. He called it bonds or chains or, you know, uh, attacks of the adversary are waiting for me. Now, if most preachers heard that today, they'd leave the ministry. Uh, Lord, what's my future look like? Bad. <laughs> Lord, there's some trials in every city you'll go to. There's adversity in every city you'll preach in. They're waiting for you. Most preachers leave the ministry. But you know what Paul said immediately after telling those people this? But none of these things move me. That's Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me. In other words, he's saying... I know what lies ahead, but I'm not moved by it. And it will not steal my joy. Amen? In fact, in prison, facing death, he wrote to the Philippian church and said, I know this will turn. And most theologians call the letter to the Philippian church, as we know today, Philippians, as the joy letter, the rejoicing letter. He's facing the worst of circumstances, and yet he writes the happiest letter he'd ever written. Wouldn't you like to get more letters like that from preachers who are going through stuff? Instead of them sad, tear-jerking ones, this is a faith ministry. But if you folks don't give, we're going under. You know, they come on television. If you folks don't give, we're going to have to go off television. I always holler back up, go off, we could use the time. We don't want to hear all that unbelief. People need to hear some good news. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm not trying to be ugly about it, but you get tired of hearing that. You know, and like some people say, well, God does all this stuff for you because you're a preacher. Well, if that's true, why we got so many begging preachers? It doesn't work for me because I'm a preacher. It works for me because I'm a covenant man. I'm a believer, and I know how to walk in his blessing, and I'm full of joy, and I don't let anything steal my joy. Hallelujah. And if you think I haven't been through some stuff, you, don't, you haven't lived with me. Joe's been with me for 35 years. We've been through some stuff. We've faced adversity that some of you will never face because you're not responsible for what we're responsible for. You know? Some of you will never have to believe God for the kind of money we have to believe for to just keep the thing going, you know? And, and most of the time, we have no idea where it's going to come from. But God, in almost 47 years of ministry, God has never let me down, never failed me, praise God. Never. Never disappointed me. Now, was it easy to maintain my joy in every situation? No, it wasn't easy. But I made it an act of my will. I will rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I will rejoice. That's an act of your will. 
Paul wrote that in Philippians 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. He didn't say as long as everything's going well. Always. Always. That means when times are good and when times are bad. You say, well, I just can't do that. You can if you get a hold of the Word of God and get it deep in your heart. Amen? How many of you know that faith is not only a spiritual force, but it is also what Paul lists as one of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. We'll keep reading the rest of the list. Joy is in there. Faith is a spiritual force, a fruit of the Spirit. Joy is a spiritual force, a fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We develop our faith by continually hearing the Word of God. If one fruit of the Spirit is developed by hearing the Word, then why wouldn't they all be developed exactly the same way? I like to say it this way. Joy cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, you're not going to find that as a scripture, but you're going to find it as a scriptural principle. Because if faith, being a fruit of the Spirit, comes by hearing and hearing the Word, then so would joy, so would long-suffering, so would meekness, so would gentleness, and all the other fruit of the Spirit. They come by hearing the Word. In fact, Jesus said that right here. These things have I spoken unto you, so that my joy will remain in you, and so that your joy will be made full. These things have I spoken. If you don't know what He's spoken, then you're never going to be able to develop your joy. So once again, the key to developing strong faith and the key to developing strong joy is you got to know what He said and you got to continually remind yourself of it. Can you say amen? amen. Know what He said and continually remind yourself of it. Hallelujah. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Now, I said all that to say this. I'm just laying the foundation there for how important joy is. Recently, the Lord said to me that He wanted to turn the tide for His people. Any of you familiar with the phrase, turn the tide? Anybody ever heard that before? If you have, lift your hand. Turn the tide. That means to cause a reversal of circumstances. To cause a reversal of circumstances. Let me read something to you from the scripture from the message translation. Watch this. In Psalm 118 and verse 15, it says, the voice of rejoicing or joy, rejoicing is a byproduct of joy in your heart. When you have joy in your heart, you're rejoicing. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacle of the righteous or the dwelling place. In other words, God says there ought to be some rejoicing in your house. Okay, I'm going to try this side of the auditorium. I said there should be some rejoicing in your house. Your, your rejoicing should not be restricted to just coming to church during the first 15 minutes when they're telling you, let's praise and worship. In fact, the reason some Christians don't do it too well in church, they don't do it well at home. Is this too deep? Huh? If you struggle praising and shouting and rejoicing in church when somebody's leading you, inspiring you, help, trying to help motivate you, if you can't do it in that atmosphere, then that tells me you're not doing it at home either. Okay, I'm going somewhere else to preach. I'm not getting any response. <laughs> he said, the voice of rejoicing is in the dwelling place of the righteous. Are you one of the righteous? Then that means there ought to be some shouting going on in your house. There ought to be some rejoicing going on in your house. There ought to be some leaping and jumping going on in your house. There ought to be some dancing before the Lord in your house. Hallelujah. 
Sometimes I just get out of bed and just go to dancing before the Lord. It's not pretty, but He likes it. Hallelujah. I wish I could do it like Creflo Dollar, but I can't. But when I get to heaven, my legs will be loosed. Hallelujah. And I'll dance like Creflo, you know. But the little dance I do, I do it to show the devil, you're not in control here. You're not final authority here. I'm, I'm a child of God. I got a covenant with the Almighty. What you're trying to do, none of that moves me. And I'm going to rejoice anyway. I'm going to shout anyway. I'm going to dance before the Lord anyway. I don't care what you do. You are not going to steal my joy. Hallelujah. Amen. Notice it says, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacle of the righteous. But listen how the message translation reads. Hear the shouts. Hear the triumphant songs in the camp of the saved. Listen to this. The hand of God has turned the tide. The hand of God is raised in victory. Notice what happens when God's people maintain their joy. Notice what happens when God's people refuse to allow Satan or people or circumstances to steal their joy. Notice what happens when God's people have shouts of triumph going on in their house, no matter what they're going through, then God promises He will turn the tide. Hallelujah. He will cause the circumstances to be reversed. Glory to God. Can you say amen? amen. I wrote a book back in 1982. That book is going around the world. It's been printed. I don't know how many reprinted. I don't know how many times it's in, printed in several foreign languages. And it's still to this day a bestseller. And it's entitled, If Satan Can't Steal Your Joy, He Can't Keep Your Goods. And the Lord taught me back then, if you do not allow Satan to steal your joy, whatever he's stolen from you, I will restore it. I'll make it. I'll make him pay you back. And so I made that decision back there in 1982 when God revealed this to me. That no matter what the devil does, I am not going to let it steal my joy. And if I continue rejoicing in spite of my circumstances, God said, I'll restore what he's stolen from you. I'll restore what he's stolen from you. I'll turn the tide. I will cause a reversal of circumstances. Amen. Well, I've seen that happen so many times. I can't even begin to tell you all the stories and testimonies that I've experienced since the day I learned that truth. But let me, let me close it out with, with one that I think you'll enjoy. It's one of my favorite stories. And it's really not about me. It's about someone who attended one of my meetings shortly after this revelation came to me. I, 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 was, I, used, I, I would rent convention centers all over the nation and do three-day crusades. And I, I had rented the Pasadena, California uh, Convention Center. And I was there for like three days. I remember Pat and Shirley Boone, Debbie Boone was in the meetings there. And uh, I'm preaching on if Satan can steal your joy. Because this was just a fresh insight in from the Word. And I'm preaching on this in every service. I had seven services, and I'm preaching on if Satan can steal your joy. Preaching about the the force of joy, how powerful joy is in a person's life. And there was a young man who was attending those meetings. He'd come up and talk to me at the close of the meeting and, and tell me how much he enjoyed the service. And he said, and I, I really identify with your background. He said, I love old cars. And he said, then uh, I, I bought an old MG that I'm believing God for the money to restore. Boy, he was excited about that old MG. And we talked car restoration for a little while, you know. And then uh, after the meeting, the last night, he was hoping that I would be able to come out to the parking lot. He drove that little OMG, even though it still needed restoration, but it was drivable. And he drove it to the meeting that night, had it in the parking lot, <clears throat> and was hoping that I'd be able to go out and see it. And I wanted to, but I had so many people that I was talking to that I just wasn't able to go out and see it. So he left and uh, closed out the meeting, and we flew back to Fort Worth, Texas, where we lived. Well, about, I don't know, less than a month, 
Uh, it was about a month later. I get a letter from this young man. He said, Brother Jerry, I'm the man that, that talked to you about my little MG during your meetings in Pasadena. And he said, you know, I was restoring, believing God for the money to restore it. And he said, that night, the last night of your meeting, when I drove it to the, to the meeting and hoping that you'd be able to come out and look at it, pray with me over it. He said, uh, I went out to the parking lot to go home and I couldn't find my car. And he said, I realized my car had been stolen. Somebody hotwired it and stole his little MG. Now this, this was real special to him, you know. And uh, he said, so someone stole my, my little MG. And he said, but you know, those sermons you preached about don't let the devil steal your joy. I was in every service. I bought a copy of the message on cassette tape, this cassette tape days. He said, I bought a cassette tape after, after every service, and, I, and I, uh, I had them all in that little MG because I'd put a tape deck in there under the dash, and I'd listen to them on the way home. He said, and he's, I remembered what you said. And he said, I stood there in that parking lot, called the police, they came and we reported it, and they said, son, it's not likely we'll ever find this car. He said, it's in a chop shop somewhere, and it's not likely that we'll ever find your car. I'm sorry, but that's just, that's just the way it is. He said, while they're saying that, I just said to them, this does not move me. <laughs> they said, pardon me? He said, I am not moved by this. It will not steal my joy. They said, are you all right? He said, I'm going to maintain my joy, and I'm not going to let the devil steal it. They finally decided, this boy... Just let him go home, you know, get him home some way. They didn't understand a thing he was talking about. But he made up his mind he was not going to let that stolen car situation steal his joy, even though this was very precious to him and dear to his heart. And he said, and the reason I'm contacting you is to give you this testimony. He said, about a month later, I get a call. And he said, my, my uh, 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 insurance card was in that car. All those tapes of your meetings were in that car. And he said, I get a call about a month later, and the man on the other end says, uh, for obvious reasons, I cannot give you my name, but I'm the man who stole your car. <laughs> he said, and I just want you to know, I listened to those tapes you had in there. I thought they were, he thought they were rock and roll music, you know, because they weren't, you know, he didn't have a, <clears throat> a, a clear label on it. He just got the tapes and, and he didn't know, the guy that stole his car assumed it might be rock and roll music or something. So he plugged one in and started listening to it. Well, he got saved after he listened to the tapes. <laughs> Amen. And so he calls this guy and says, I'm the man who stole your car for obvious reasons. I can't give you my name, but I do want you to know after listening to that Jerry Savelle, I have given my life to the Lord and I want to give you your car back. And here's where you can find it. The keys are under the mat, but you won't recognize it because I completely restored it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's exactly what God said. I will turn the tide. If I can find rejoicing in the house of the righteous, I will turn the tide for them. I will reverse their circumstances. That's exactly what this young man did. Hallelujah. And the man that stole it restored the car and, the, and, and it turned out better than when the man had the car before it was stolen. Well, you see, that's the way God is. When God restored Job, did you notice he didn't give him exactly what had been taken from him? He doubled it. See, in Jerry's paint and body shop and Jerry's restoration shop, my definition of restore back then was bring back to original condition. I had people bring me their cars and say, Jerry, restore this. And sometimes they'd bring it on a trailer in pieces. Sometimes half the pieces were missing. Sometimes they were in buckets or boxes. Sometimes it was totally rusted out and I'd have to find other parts. But when they said restore it, that meant bring it back to original condition. If they said customize it, that's a different story. But restore, that's the definition of Jerry's paint body shop for restore, bring back to original condition. It's still my hobby. 
even though I don't do it full time anymore, but I still collect classic cars and I love restoring them. And some of them I have brought back to original condition. There are others I've made street rods out of. And they're better, hallelujah, and faster <laughs> and louder, hallelujah. Well, you see, God's definition of restore is never bring back to original condition. God's definition of restore is to improve, increase, multiply, and make better. And that's what God is saying to you this morning. If you will not allow your circumstances, whatever you might be going through, if you will not allow them to steal your joy, if you won't allow them to affect your relationship with God, if you won't allow them to keep you out of church, if you won't allow them to prevent you from tithing. You know, a lot of people quit tithing, quit coming to church when circumstances are negative. But if you just stand up in the devil's face and tell him, none of this moves me and you're not getting my joy, then God says he will turn the tide He will cause a reversal of circumstances. He will restore. And when he's finished with you, you're going to be improved, increased, multiplied, and even better. Hallelujah. Give the Lord your best shout this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Now smile at somebody and say, I am full of joy. And the devil's not going to get it. Now, let me warn you just as we close. Satan comes immediately to steal the word. He attempts to steal the word immediately. You can walk out of this service inspired, motivated, full of joy, and walk out there in the parking lot and got a flat tire, and there goes your joy. (laughs) Bless God. Why does this always happen to me? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Jesus said he'd come immediately to try to steal it. Don't let a flat tire rob you of a spiritual truth. Don't let some negative piece of mail that comes to your house rob you of this God kind of restoration. Amen. You develop your faith and develop your joy to the point that you're not just saying it because Paul said it, but you're saying it because it's a revelation to you like it was to Paul, that none of this moves me. And you talk about living in victory. Hallelujah. You'll live in victory for the rest of your life. Give the Lord another shout of praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stand up if you will. Praise God. Let's all lift our hands and bless the Lord. And let's just act on what we've heard and do a little rejoicing here for a moment. Come on, you just start rejoicing. Give voice to joy. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm quite sure that there are many of you and perhaps even all of you that are going through some impossible looking situations right now. But don't let it steal your joy. God wants to turn the tide. He turned it for Job. He turned it for Joseph. Oh, he turned it for Daniel. There are stories all over the Bible where God turns the tide for his people. And he's still doing it today. But you got to give him something to work with. Maintain your faith. Maintain your joy. Father, I've endeavored to deliver this word this morning. I believe it's fallen in good soil. Hearts have been receptive. Minds have been open to receive your word. And Lord, I believe it will not be taken from them. And Lord, as they continue to study these principles... I pray that their faith will reach levels they've never experienced before. The joy of the Lord will rise up on the inside of them like they've never experienced before. And that this will lead them into greater victories than they've ever experienced before. Lord, you told me you wanted to turn the tide. You wanted to turn the tide in the lives of your people. Well, now they know how to position themselves to experience that. And I just believe there will be some major testimonies that will come from this service this morning of how you caused a reversal of circumstances and caused your people to rise above them and caused them to experience greater victories. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Look over at somebody. Amen. Look over at somebody and smile real big. 
and say, don't ever let the devil steal your joy. Thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm sure you've been blessed. I'd like to share with you just some information of how you can contact Word of Life Christian Center. Again, our pastors are Pastor Art and Kuna Sapovida. Our church is in Honolulu, Hawaii. Our mailing address is 550 Queen Street, Honolulu, Hawaii, 96813. If you still use mail, you can go, go ahead and mail us. But you can also contact us via email if you have any questions, if you have anything you want to share with us, you can email us at wolcc at wolhawaii.com. Again, that's wolcc, which stands for Word of Life Christian Center, wolcc at wordoflifehawaii.com. Please email us if you have any questions or if you want to share any testimonies of what God is doing in your life. And we can also we also have a church in Yokohama. If you're ever in Word of Life Yokohama, our pastor there is Pastor Fukiko Matsuzawa. And her phone number, well, let me give you her email. Um W O L dot Japan at F L U T E dot O C N dot n e dot j p you can e- you can also email word of life yokohama if you're ever going to be in the tokyo yokohama area thank you so much for joining us we look forward to being with you again next saturday at 9 a.m until then aloha <laughs> <laughs>